Good evening. This is Miss Virginia from Springboro Public Library, and I'm here to read you some more stories. And tonight I have two books, and they're Christmas books, so they're very interesting. The first story is called An Orange for Frankie, and it's written, and the pictures are drawn by Patricia Polacco. And there you see Frankie on the front with an orange, and in the background you see a fireplace. Because this is back when they didn't have the furnaces and they didn't have the cars, they had trains. And they the families the families didn't have a lot of money because it was really hard time. So it's an orange for Frankie. And there you see a picture of the train. Orange for Frankie. There's a picture of them walking from the train to the farmhouse. There was no McDonald's back then, so when the train stopped to get water because they were steam engines, they stopped at farmhouses close by and the farm ladies would feed them. It was early winter, a morning mist lingered over the frosty fields in Lock Center. The snow whirled along the rail bed in front of the 628 freight train, hurling along the tracks out of Lansing bound for Detroit. Frankie was the youngest boy in the Stowell family. He was all of ten. He shared his room with his two older brothers, Will, who was thirteen, and Ernest, the sixteen-year-old. They all awoke to the whistle of the 628 and as it chucked up to a stop at the water tower at the edge of their property. Frankie sprang out of bed and leapt to the winter, winter light. She's steaming in and right on time, too, he sang out excitedly. The boys dressed as fast as they could and tumbled down the stairs to their ma's kitchen. They were chores to do before school, and they had to help with breakfast for the guests that would soon arrive at their back door. And there's Frankie looking out the window. The kitchen was already smelling like hotcakes and warm molasses. The aroma of coffee and chicory was hanging low in the air, and the thick rashers of bacon and salt pork were spitting and sizzling in a pan on the cook stove. Frankie's three younger sisters were already downstairs. Bertha turned out the skillet of cornbread to cool on the sideboard. She was nine, and the oldest girl still at home. Alta, the six-year-old, was getting eggs from the glassine crock to be fried up, while Iva, the three-year-old, played with corn dolls in the pantry. And there she is. Frankie's three older sisters, Stella, Ada, and Mabel, had gone to normal school and were teaching, though Stella, the oldest, had gotten married and was a mother of a three-year-old. She and her husband were farming the spread right next door over the holler. Look at, Mr. it's Mr. Dunkel, and he's the engineer today, Will announced as he looked out the kitchen window light. Their ma looked and smiled, then surveyed the raggedy men, hobos, who were coming up to the house behind them. The raggedy men were men that didn't have jobs or homes or families. They, they were called hobos back then. And they rode the train rails. They weren't supposed to because they didn't pay, but they did. Mrs. Sowell swung open the back door and handed the engineer a stoking cup of hot coffee. Step in. Looks like a cold out there and it's blowing. Hard, hard up your back, she called out. Then she served up a plate of hot hoe cakes for him. You boys see to it that those men out there get washed up and full of hot grub too, she said, as she dribbled molasses on the hoe cakes and motioned to the four men built huddling together. Ernest, Will, and Frankie toted baskets of food to the back door. Bertha set out a bucket of steaming water with a chunk of lye soap and a towel. The men dragged off their mufflers and hats and rolled up their threadbare sleeves and washed themselves. Much obliged, they muttered. Mr. Dun Mr. Dunkel, like most of the engineers, bulls on this line, wasn't supposed to allow hobos on his train. But he knew the times were hard and those men got very little kindness from the old world. So he turned a blind eye. Frankie kept hobos' cups filled with hot coffee. Most of them had come through before, except for one. 
Frankie noticed the man couldn't stop shivering, wearing a fur hat but threadbare coat. He seemed much older than the others. He smiled warmly when Frankly, Frankie filled his cup. Mrs. Stowook chatted with the men. She always called the travelers Mr., even though they had names like Boxcar Eddie or Too Tall Jake or Bull Trip Charlie. What's your name, Mr. Frankie? Fine finally asked the old man. The man's eyes softened. Jump up, Billy, he said, and when he reached up for Frankie to fill his cup again, Frankie could see under his coat, and he didn't have a shirt. There's a picture of the men and getting food. Frankie raced up to his room and pawed through his sweater drawer. Most of the sweaters were too little for Frankie, let alone big old man like Jump Up Billy. Then Frankie pulled out his best sweater, the only one that would be big enough, and he especially loved that sweater because Stella had knitted it for him last Christmas. But the old man needed it far more than he did. Frankie stuffed it under his waistcoat. He didn't want his ma to see what he was doing. Outside, he pulled the, out, pulled the old man away from the others behind the shed and gave him the sweater. The old man threw off his coat and eagerly pulled the sweater on, smiling as he stroked it. Now ain't this purdy, he whispered. There's a fine belly in her, boys. Time to set fire in the belly, boys. Time to set the trails. Mrs. Dunk Mr. Dunkel called out after bolting down the last cup of his coffee. Frankie hurriedly helped the old man on with his coat. Best vittles this side of the Rockies, Mrs. Miss, Mr. Duncan called out as he and the hobos crossed the field to the waiting train. They had to wait until they got enough steam up after they put water in. There is Jump Up Billy in his red sweater, Frankie's red sweater. That was Frankie's favorite sweater because his sister had made it for him last year. When all of the hobos had crawled into their open boxcars, they lifted up their hats and waved to the 628, blew its whistle, and jolted to start. The big iron wheels pumped and spun in place as the billions of steam hissed and puffed with each turn. Finally, the train jerked, and out of all the cars made a clanging sound, and the train was underway. As Mrs. Stoll and the others went into the house, Frankie watched the train until it disappeared. Its whistle Growing fainter and fainter, it made Frankie think about his pa. Christmas was almost here. Pa should have been back now. Frankie was looking forward to gathering boughs of greens for the mantle, but oranges were always the crowning touch. Nine of them, one for each of the Stowell children. Their father had driven horse and buggy all the way to Lansing to fetch those precious oranges back home for Christmas. Mr. Dunkel had said there was a powerful bad weather up in Lansing. This was to be the weather, it must be the weather is holding Ma up, Frankie hoped to himself. Well, there's a picture of Frankie and his dog and he's waving by to the train. School that day seemed to last forever. Frankie was glad to be home, even if he was having to stand still while his mother pinned up the hem of his angel costume for the Christmas pageant. He had always wanted to be in the pageant, and this year Miss Longstreet picked him to be the archangel. Hold still, Frankie, Mrs. Scowell told, scolded. I can barely see these small pins, and your wiggling doesn't help. When are you going to get spectacles, Ma? Frankie was only tap teasing. When pigs fly, son, we sure can't afford spectacles. We haven't finished paying off our winter hog, she answered. If times are that hard for us, Ma, then we sure can't afford to be feeding them hobos every week, Will said. Mrs. Stowell gave Will a withering look. We had an abundant harvest, and it don't cost us nothing to share some of it with folks that could use it. Just then was the stomping at the front porch. The door threw, flew open and the snow whirled into the parlor. It was Ada and Mabel. Look, Ma, they're, they're home. Bertha and Ada sang out as they leapt into their uh, older sister's arms. Everyone cheered and hugged. But where's Pa, Ada called out. He's always here to greet us, Mabel added. 
Their ma told them about the bad weather and that their father was probably delayed because of it. And there they are, the girls running to their big sisters. Happy to see him home. Later that evening, Stella, Fred, and baby May arrived. Soon everyone was in the kitchen helping Ma with supper. Frankie smiled to himself. It was almost as if none of them had left home. Everyone was together again. As they sat down to eat, Mrs. Stowell said a right perfect blessing. Frankie was so hungry and everything looked so good. Frankie, Stella began, this year I knitted you a muffler to match the Christmas sweater I gave you last year. I can't wait to see how it will look. Frankie almost choked on his mashed potatoes. Maybe you should try it on tonight, Mrs. Stowell sang out. Frankie squirmed and changed the subject. Do you think Pa will still try to bring home the Christmas oranges? Him being so late and all. Nothing in this world would stop him from bringing home our Christmas oranges, boy, Mrs. Stowell said. The conversation around the table successfully switched to talk of Pa and the oranges. Frankie sighed with relief. There they are, the big family, eating their supper, talking about things at Christmas. Another whole day passed, and the Stowolf household was uneasy. Pa still wasn't home, and they had gotten no word. Christmas was only two days away. Pa had never been this late from Lansing to fetch the oranges from a Florida train. Ada and Mabel had busied themselves with baking and decorating cookies. Bertha and Alte were helping roll out the fondant. And Ernest and Frankie and Will were eyeing the cakes baked for the social that was always held after the pageant on Christmas Eve. Even so, all their hearts were heavy with worry. Pa would have picked the perfect tree for the parlor by now, Frankie said sadly. And there'd be greens on the hearth with apples and cookies too, Bertha whispered. No, Onga's little Iva gurgled, pointing at the mantle. Even she knew that Christmas Eve meant oranges, and they were placed on the mantle just when Mrs. Stowell busied into the parlor. She was worried, all right, but she didn't show it. Now hark, children, everyone get on your winter togs. I've got soapstones already heating in the stove. Will you and Ernest hitch up the sled? Dre, and we're going out to find the perfect tree and gather them greens for the mantle, she announced. Now, what your pa, that's what your pa would want all of us to do, not to sit in the parlor all vexed with botherment. Everyone's spirits lifted. Scurrying for their coats, they set out to do as their mother had bid them. The soapstones were wrapped in a burlap and placed in the floor of the sled dray. Four thick wool blankets covered them all as they set out to find their Christmas tree and evergreens. Penny and Fanny's steps were sure and steady, and the bells on their harnesses rang and echoed across the snowy dells. Bertha, Alta, and Frankie were singing as they went. There they are, getting ready to go out on the, on the sleigh. I didn't notice they have a bunch of kittens and a cat and a dog in the house. Finally, they came to the clearing. It was dotted with fine firs and pines. The family poured out of the sled dray and fanned out. The girls and I will gather the greens. You boys go get the perfect tree, Mrs. Stowell called out. Frankie, Will, and Ernest searched everywhere for the perfect tree. How they wished their pa was with them. Just when they were wondering if they would ever find the tree, they came over a small hillock. There it is, all by itself, as if it was just waiting for them to come and become the tree for the Stowell Parlor. Nearest the tree right there. The boys are standing in front of it. So it looks like they're getting ready for Christmas. That wasn't what Frankie had meant at all, but with their, oh, I skipped a page. There, doesn't that just look grand, Mrs. Stowell cooed that night as she adjusted the last clump of greens on the mantel? I gotta get apples and nuts, Alta called out. 
I want to put on the dried flowers and the holly sprigs, Bertha squealed. Meantime, Frankie, Will, and Ernest were sinking the tree into a bucket of wet sand, while Ada and Mabel gave them orders, just as they did every Christmas. No, no, that isn't straight from here, Ada scolded. A little more to your right. The fullest part of the tree will be facing the wall, Mabel said. The boys twisted and turned, trying to lean the tree this way and that. Suddenly, all the others shouted in unison, That's it! It's perfect! And they all stood back, and it was perfect. And the whole family was started decorating the tree. What a glorious surprise this will be for your pa when he gets home, Mrs. Stowell whispered. Not for one minute did anyone think that he wouldn't get home. Ma and Alda strung berries and popcorn to put on the tree, while Bertha and Alta tried to, tied the dried flowers. Frankie and Iva hung the frosted cookies, though they probably are not more than they probably ate more than they hung. The fire was crackling in a fireplace. Everything seemed to be warm and cozy. Then Frankie looked out the parlor, parlor window light. It was snowing real hard. How will Pa get through this, he said with, uh, with alarm. Everyone came to the window. The mantle looks so bare without the oranges, Frankie blurted out. The oranges, Ada scolded. Is that all you can think about, Mabel added. Frankie, isn't it just like you to be so selfish? Who cares if it's oranges ever get here? All we want is Pa, Bertha cried. And they are decorating your tree. They didn't put lights in, in that on their trees back then. Just popcorn and, and cookies and cranberries and homemade decorations. That wasn't what Frankie had meant at all, but with everyone being so upset, tempers were frayed. I ain't selfish, Ma, Frankie cried later that night. All I meant was the oranges being there would mean Pa's home safe and sound. I know that and so do they. We're also worried about your Pa, but maybe he'll be home by tomorrow. We'll pray for that tonight, his Ma said as she kissed her youngest son goodnight. That night Frankie prayed for a miracle to bring his Pa home, but outside it snowed and snowed and snowed, and by morning all the roads were closed and there was no way for his buggy to get home. The next morning, the morning Christmas Eve, Frankie and his brothers awoke to the 628 whistle as it steamed through their pasture. When Frankie came down to breakfast, he was wearing his old gray sweater. He had almost outgrown it. Frankie, aren't you going to wear your, uh, your sister Stella's Christmas sweater? His ma asked. She and Fred will be coming over after the pageant this morning. Here's Frankie looking out the window at the snow. He was kind of sad. He was crying. A lot of sisters were being mean to him. Frankie was about to tell his mom the truth when Will called out, It's Pa! It's Pa! And everyone ran to the parlor. They almost swept their paw clean off his feet with their hugs and kisses. My little lambs, my precious little lambs, their paw whispered as he hugged each one of them. Oh, Frank, Mrs. Stowe will cry, how ever did you get here? Well, then, I met that train from Florida at the station to fetch home these here oranges, and I could hardly see the engine. It was snowing so bad. Then I found out that all the roads were closed, and my heart fair broke. But you're here, Pa, Will exclaimed, and I won't, wouldn't be if it hadn't been for Mr. Dunkel. He overheard me lamenting about not getting home, and he said there was only one thing for me to do, to ride to 628. Why, he even let me sit up in the engine with him all the way here, and he loaded the horse and buggy into the box car and brought them right along with us. Now, I just wonder what would make him think so to be so kind to me and my family. Pa looked over at Ma when he said that. I tell you, Rosal, it was a miracle. That's what it was, a miracle. And he was thinking about all the good breakfasts that he got fed from the family and how kind they were to the raggedy men. It being morning of the eve of our Lord's birth, I think we have just exactly the right moment to put the oranges on the mantle after the pageant, before the pageant 
over the, to the church, the Pa said as he pulled the cover off the crate of the luscious oranges inside. Each of the children, young and old, took an orange out of the box and placed it on the mantelpiece. Then everyone stood and looked at them. How beautiful they were. Nine oranges nestled in the greens, one for each of them. Hark now, children, don't be tempted to touch them. They are for our Christmas Eve supper tonight, Pa said, as he went with the rest of the family to dress for church. Frankly, he loved this day the most of all, and since he was already dressed, he stayed in the parlor. He walked over to the mantel and gazed at the splendid oranges. His heart sang that his pa was home and safe. He looked at the oranges closer and closer. He could smell the pungent aroma of their skins. He noticed how they seemed to have pores, just like his own skin. And finally, he couldn't resist. He looked to see if anyone was in the kitchen. And even though he'd been told not to, he gently touched his orange. Then he picked it up. It smelled like sunshine. It was ripe and heavy with juice. He couldn't wait to taste it that night. Suddenly, he heard someone coming, his mother. Frankie, she called. He didn't have time to put the orange back on the mantel. He quickly stuffed it into his sweater. Then he would put it back when they got home from the pageant. And no one would know that he had disobeyed his father. Uh-oh. You think he's going to get caught? Usually, you get caught when you do stuff like that. Frankie was indeed a perfect archangel in the Christmas pageant. Everyone commented on he looked just like a real angel. Later, as they were making their way home in the sleigh, bumping over the hills and dales, Frankie was exploding with the thought of eating his orange that night. Then he remembered, and he felt in his sweater. To his horror, the orange wasn't there. He must have dropped it. Frankie looked at his pa's face and fought back the tears. How could he have been so careless? His orange, his precious orange, lost. Finally home, Frankie hurried to his room. He wept bitterly, afraid to go down to the parlor and face his family. There was a knock on the door. His ma, Frankie dear, everyone's waiting. We're ready to tell stories and popcorn is popping, and then it'll be time for the oranges. Frankie opened the door. Oh, Ma, I've done a terrible thing. Here they are in a the sleigh on their way home. That's when Frankie discovered that he didn't have his orange. You can see his face looking at his father. What do you mean, his mother said as she uh, patted him to sit next to her on his bed. I lost my orange, Frankie blurted out. What? But how, Frankie? When everyone was getting dressed, I just wanted to hold that orange, and so I did. And I was just looking at it, nothing more than that, but Pa said not to touch him. So when you come in, I slipped it into my sweater. I was going to put it back, Ma. Oh, he stopped, but I lost it. Oh, my dear boy, your Pa went through so much to fetch those orange, oranges home for us, his mother whispered. That's not all, Ma. Stella's sweater? I gave it to one of those hobos, he sobbed. When his mother finally smoke, spoke, she said, Frankie, you didn't do a terrible thing. Maybe a thoughtless thing taking that orange, but you did a noble thing, too, getting something that meant so much to you, to someone who needed it. That is the true Christmas spirit, my darling. Now you stay here and collect yourself, and I'll call you when we're ready tonight. Ma whispered almost mysteriously. Here's Ma comforting Frankie. Frankie's so sad. When Frankie finally came downstairs, all of his brothers and sisters were waiting. We have something for you, Frankie, Stella said as she handed him a bright orange with a pink ribbon tied around it. When Frankie looked at the orange, he noticed that it was made up of wedges, eight wedges. The ribbon, ribbon held them together. He looked at all of his brothers and sisters. Each of them held out their, his or her orange, and a section of each was missing. They had given him wedges of their orange, or own orange to make an orange for Frankie. Our family is like your orange, Frankie. Their pa said softly, love holds us together like that ribbon. Here they are with their oranges. 
that's all kids got was like homemade presents and oranges. When, when I was a child, we got an orange and we got a candy cake and a, a little box of candy. So when, when your parents don't have a lot of money, you don't get a lot for Christmas. That was the most splendid Christmas ever for Frankie and for all the Stowells. The oranges were eaten and all nine of them savored down to the last bite. Stories were told in front of the fireplace. Popcorn was popped and eaten. And hot chocolate was slurped down with gusto. And when the family was snug in their beds that night, Frankie's ma and pa looked in on him. They would tell for years to come how beautiful he was and that he looked like a sleeping angel and how precious that particular Christmas was to all of them. It was always known ever after as Frankie's Christmas. And there's Frankie sleeping in his bed and the dog and Mom and Pa looking at him. So they had a happy Christmas. Doesn't matter what you get for Christmas, it's just if you're with your family. And if you're all happy, you have something to eat and you're warm and safe. My next book is called Santa Stuck, and it's written by Rhonda Gowler Green, and the pictures are drawn by Henry Cole. And there's a picture of the reindeer and Santa's boots at the bottom here, and the dog and cat looking at Santa. And on the back, there's a picture of Santa looking at goodies. Santa's stuck. You can see two little kittens on the mantle, and the dog, and the cat. Here's a picture of the Christmas tree. What do you think would happen if Santa got stuck? There's Santa here. Toys were nestled in tree lights glow, stocking stuff march in a row. Santa sighs. It's time to go. He gathers up his giant sack, spies a note, and a Christmas snack. And there it says, Dear Santa, we have been very good. Oh, I'm going to show you the picture up close. Boys and girls have been so kind, they left sweets for him to find. Mmm, his suit feels rather snug. Santa shrugs a jolly shrug. One more cookie couldn't hurt. This last snack will be dessert. There he is, reading his list of good boys and girls. And eating cookies. Santa rests his weary feet and munches on a scrumptious tree. Nibble, nibble, tasty crumbs, licks the frosting from his thumbs. Smacks his lips on fruitcake, too. Wolf down, wolf's down the whole thing. Chomp, chomp, chew. Chocolate fudge, he sneaks a piece, can't resist. He has a feast. And look at, there's a whole bunch of goodies right here on the table. There's cookies and cake and fudge, all kinds of stuff for Santa. Now, my house, Santa liked fudge and coffee. Belly bulges and Santa stops. Oh, oh, look, a button pops. And there goes the button flying. He's got a piece of pie. Restless reindeer, cold wind blows. Up the chimney, Santa goes. And there he is, bent over. Suddenly a sound is heard, tap, 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 and one weird word, help. There's the reindeer looking down the chimneys, hearing that word, help. What are they going to do, huh? Little ones tucked in their beds, candy cane dreams in their heads. Slumber on and don't hear a peep, but dog bolts turn upright from his sleep. Bravely pit pats down the stair, sees the boot kicking in the air. Uh oh, the dog sees him. Santa's stuck. Santa whistles.
whispers, I'm stuck tight. Dog helps push with all his might. No luck. Santa's stuck. Meanwhile, reindeer heed the plea from form a chain and they pull on three. He says, I'm stuck tight. Look at the dog. He's trying to help. And reindeer's trying to help and he's just stuck in there. One, two, three. Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donder, Blitzen, Rain, Rudolph, too. They all heave ho as one dog pushes down below. No luck. Santa's stuck. See that dog pushes down below and the reindeer pulling really hard? The reindeer's strong. Mama Cats wakes up from her nap and hears the help in a rap tap tap. Sees that Santa's in a fix, calls her kittens one through six. One, two, three, four, five, six. There they are. Six kittens, one cat and a dog. Santa's boots and he's saying, help! Reindeer, dog, kittens, cat. Pull like this and push like that. No luck. Santa's stuck. Ho, 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 a tiny mouse stirs inside his tiny house. There he is. In that little circle there, he's in bed. Scampers out to lend a hand. Santa gives the go command. There is the mouse. He's got a light bulb over his head like he's got an idea. Push. Pull. Push. Pull. Puck. Look at the mouse is driving the little boy's truck. It's got a it's got a bucket on the front to push Santa. It goes push, pop, push. There goes Santa flying through the air with the reindeer. Okay, I forgot to show you this. See the mouse with the little toy pushing. All the presents in that flying. And there he is up there. He's reindeer pulled, and there he comes flying out, hanging on to the chain from the, the reindeers. Sand is out. Silent cheer. Reindeer harness up their gear. Back inside his Christmas sleigh. Santa shouts, now dash away. And there is Santa. He's getting ready to go to someone else. I hope he don't get stuck in someone else's house. Maybe he'll stop eating goodies tonight, huh? Then he waves and soars from sight. Merry Christmas and a good night. Well, that's our, our stories for tonight. And... I hope to see you back at the library soon. Uh, there's going to be take and makes in the library. And there's lots of there's new Christmas books and videos for you to take out. And we're just hoping that you have a good holiday. Merry Christmas. And I'm saying goodbye from Miss Virginia.